Hello YouTube. Uh, appreciate those of you been watching the Edwards videos. This is day number three on the trip, uh, which would make it the fourth video. So far we have seen in the first video, which was an introduction, how I got into Edwards, um, a little bit about this book that would be very helpful if you ever plan to do a trip like this or if you just like to see um, all of the pictures. Uh, that was the introduction on the second video, which covered Monday, October 30th of the trip. That was Enfield, East Windsor, and, um, and Weathersfield. We saw that on the Monday video. The Tuesday video took us to Stockbridge, and that's where Edward spent the last few years of his life as a uh, pastor there, missionary to the Indians. Um, the, the last photo we saw on the uh, previous video was the Edwards descendants. They met back together in 1874 to view this monument right here um, that was constructed in 1872 I believe it was 1870 they met together 1874 they met back together to see what was built in the uh, couple of years uh, between those two meetings and uh, so that left us um, that left us with Tuesday October 31st you can see on the time there that was about 630 in the evening and uh, was wrapping wrapping the night up so the next uh, stop takes us back in time as far as Edwards uh, uh, as far as the chronology goes but this would be Wednesday November 1st of my trip so here we are on day number three I'd spoken previously with Miss Elise Benier Feely I saw a video of her on YouTube I'm just searching different things on YouTube I came across a video um, in fact I'll I'll put it in the um, in in the YouTube links there in the description. But there's a video of Miss Feely, Bernier Feely, um, maybe a few years ago, somewhere in there, where the local uh, the local PBS type station uh, talked with her and made a video, a fairly long video, over an hour. But there's about a 10-15 minute spot in that video that is just about uh, Jonathan Edwards and Edwards related things. And watching that, um, you could tell her, her passion for it, especially when she spoke of the uncommon union, union between Jonathan and Sarah. So uh, I, I sent her an email. Um, I, I think back in that time, uh, sent her a letter, talked to her on the phone uh, once, a particular question about David Brainerd and Jerusha Edwards. And then when I knew that the trip was going to be possible, I called her about a day after the, the ticket was booked and I told her that I was going to be coming uh, up to Northampton because she had told me before if I ever was able to make the trip to let her know and she graciously offered um, to spend the day with me uh, during this trip she normally works uh, Thursday Friday and Saturday she's the local historian there at the Forbes library in Northampton and uh, worked it out where I came to Northampton on the on that Wednesday uh, when she was off and, uh, and she spent almost the whole day with me. So that was very, uh, very nice of her, very generous of her, and it worked out well. Walking Northampton Encyclopedia. So uh, this was a, a nice little greeting. Wasn't expecting that, but a little picture of Jonathan Edwards and the sign uh, welcoming at the door. Uh, it's on the top floor of the library. Very, very, very nice library, and uh, has her own separate room there. One of the things she showed me at the beginning was that when Jonathan's house um, was built, or, or Jonathan, where, where Jonathan and Sarah and his family lived, that he had some elm trees uh, planted there. If you ever save the search for Jonathan Edwards on eBay, uh, a lot of times, uh, well, ever so often, you'll see a postcard that comes up where it's a, a postcard, usually it's in a green ink color, and it's called the Jonathan Edwards Elm. And supposedly in that elm tree is where he sat up under or studied or whatever. Well, the house was uh, eventually uh, destroyed or demolished, and the trees uh, eventually fell. Uh, Miss Miss Elise told me whatever the um, the disease the tree caught uh, some kind of bug got sick, and the the trees died. And they took the um, piece of the tree and cut it and they have this on display at the library 
So a section of the Edwards Elm fell August the 8th of 1913. So there's a little tangible piece of history from the life of Edwards. Here is something. I can't remember what that was, but um, I'm thinking that was a list of receipts. Yeah, I believe that was like an account, an account that Edwards kept of maybe some family purchases or things. And here was um, a letter uh, to Eliezer Willock um, from Jonathan Edwards, October the 9th, I believe that is, 1740, which will turn out to be another important day in the, the Edwards and his family's history. And uh, so that was nice being able to see this letter that, that Edwards wrote. Um, there is a letter from his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, who is the reason Edwards ended up at Northampton, Solomon Stoddard, the Pope of the Connecticut River Valley, uh, pastor for about 60 years there at the church at Northampton, um, realized that he's getting older, I presume, and I don't know exactly how the search went, um, but Edwards, Jonathan, ended up becoming the assistant to Solomon Stoddard in 1723, I believe it was, 1723, February 15th or 13th, 1723, I think, and then in 1726 is when um, Edwards actually became the, the pastor when Solomon passed away. I believe I'm correct on those dates. Um, give you an idea, here is a sermon of Solomon Stoddard, and you can see with a little piece of, pe little piece of paper there, even compared to that quarter, how small the writing was um, that Solomon uh, went by. Another letter. Here is the seating chart in the church at Northampton. Uh, we see there in section number two was where Mrs. Edwards uh, and her family would have sat. And there's the more complete view of the seating arrangements there at Northampton. Here is a piece, um, well there's the, the stone on the right, and then there's a plaque next to it. This is on the back side of the library, so if you're ever at the library, the Forbes Library at Northampton, and you're looking at the front entrance, this would be on the back left of the library. And you can see this granite stone was a doorstep for the Jonathan Edwards homestead on King Street, and I'll show you a little bit later where that is. Um, from approximately 1728 to 1750. Uh, Edwards was the famous minister, great thinker, and prolific author whose writings inspired the religious movement known as the Great Awakening. All right, so uh, Miss, uh, Miss Elise, she showed me the things there at the library. Um, we spent some time there, and then uh, she had to break. She had something to take care of at uh, uh, local church for lunch and then we met back we met back up after lunch and the next place that she was going to take me to was the church there at Northampton where Edwards uh, was the pastor well the church closed at two o'clock um, I told them uh, I'd called them prior told them that I was my trip and that I would be there and things and uh, they told me that somebody would be there t until two o'clock and so I told Miss Elise uh, when she got when we met back together if this could be the next place we went because somebody was supposed to be there until two o'clock so it's about 1 30 1 45 uh, we go to the church we uh ring the little doorbell there nobody comes um i try calling on the the phone number there for the church nobody answers and so a um, little bit discouraged about that it looks like we're not going to be able to go into the church and then I, I believe a, a kind, gracious act of providence. There was a group of people there in the church working for a local um, mercy type ministry, something along those lines. And so me and Miss Elise are standing there at the door. We can't get in. Nobody's answering anything. Well, a guy comes down the sidewalk and he comes up to the door there. And uh, we told him, said, you know, we tried to get in and nobody's coming to the door. And uh, he said, did you call? And, and I said, yeah, we called. Well, he had a number for someone who was in there actually participating in that mercy ministry, 
the number I was trying to get in touch with was the secretary for the church. And so um, he called, and the person came to the door to, to let him in to, so he could pick up his items or help with the distributing the items or whatever. And uh, so here we are, the door is open. Miss Elise tells the lady who she is, that she's been there plenty of times before, and we, we go right on in. So that, was, that worked out really well. Well, while we're in there, uh, we go into the, the sanctuary there, and you can see the big memorial there for Edwards on the wall. Now, I've seen a picture of this before on different websites. Um, just in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, something about like this, maybe this big, maybe one foot tall, two foot tall at the back of the church. Well, when you actually get into the sanctuary, you can get an idea for, for how big it really is. Uh, read that to you. Um, it says, In memory of Jonathan Edwards, minister of Northampton from February 15, 1727. Okay, forgive me. I thought it was 1726. February 15, 1727 to June 22, 1750. Uh, the law of truth was in his mouth, and unrighteousness was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and did turn many away from iniquity. From the book of Malachi. A few angles of it. And there, that will give you an idea really, really how big this memorial is. You're looking towards the front of the church there, and there on the wall, um, you're talking about something maybe six foot tall so a, a lot bigger than I was expecting um, but they they still have that there at the the church there all right few little sketches um, of the from the the history of the church at Northampton so there's what the church would have looked like in the uh, a little bit of time while Edwards was there you can see up on the um, top right there's a, a smaller one. Top left, the second church building where Edwards would have been um, at the beginning. The third church building where would have still been while Edwards was there. And then the fourth church, and then the fifth church, which is the, the present structure. They had a few little items uh, there in the church there. Uh, there's one, one letter um, that they had on a little display in a room. Um, Miss, uh, Miss Elise said that there, there was a chair that was made from the wood that came either from Edwards' home or from the original Edwards' time church structure. Uh, but there were still some, uh, I believe they were putting out some Christmas decorations, and she said the chair must have been moved. So we did not get to, to see that. But we did get to go into the church and the main thing, see the memorial there up on the wall. Now, after we left there, uh, we uh, drove a short little distance, and there's another church in town, uh, which is called the, uh, I, I think it's just called Edwards Church, or uh, something like that, or Edwards Memorial Church, or something along those lines, which was started many, many years after Edwards, uh, I think after he even passed away. Uh, so the church actually has no connection to, to Edwards, um, like he didn't preach in this building or anything, um, but I think it's just a group of people who, from that church, maybe started another one, something along those lines. We did not go in there, um, but we did walk by, and they had a few little things on the wall here on the outside. Um, 1620, 1703 to 1758, there, Edwards, and then Mr. Hooker, and then um, 1806 there. If I'm not mistaken, I think that's when this Edwards church began, I believe. All right, so after we left there, we went to the uh, Bridge Street Cemetery there in Northampton, where uh, there'll be some familiar names, and, and almost said names and faces, no faces, but names and uh, memorials. The first one I took a picture of um, was the uh, grave of David Brainerd, and next to David would be Jonathan and Sarah's daughter, um, Jerusha. All right, uh, one little piece of advice. If you do go to this cemetery, um, it would be good if you could find a map or something online. Thankfully, I didn't need to do that. had the, the walking Northampton Encyclopedia, Miss Elise, with me. Um, but this is a, a very, very, very big cemetery. There, there would be no possible way 
you know, you would find these things in 10 or 15 minutes of walking around. It's just way too big. A um, lot bigger than the ones I'm used to uh, here in our town. Well, so you come up to it, and um, here is um, uh, David's. It said, uh, Sacred to the memory of the Reverend David Brainerd, faithful and laborious missionary to the Stockbridge, Delaware, and I'll mispronounce that, tribes of Indians who died in this town's October 10th, which I believe should be um, October the 9th, 1747. And then next to him is Miss Jerusha, daughter of uh, Jonathan and Sarah Edwards, born April 26, 17... Um, not sure what that is. And then died uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day, on 1748. So uh, David died in the fall of 1747, and just a few months after that, uh, Jerusha passed away um, a few months later during the winter, early spring, winter of the, the next year. The, the very first conversation I had with Miss... Um, with Miss Elise over the phone. I was asking her about this as I was reading in one of the, the Edwards biographies. Uh, I believe it was the, uh, I read the Murray, Murray biography of Edwards right there first. Um, and then the next biography I read of Edwards would have been the Marston's um, biography. And I, and I got to this section and, you know, you're always, you're used to hearing it said that uh, they were engaged or they, they were going to be married. Um, it appears that nothing was actually concrete about that. But the fact that they were buried together, you know, j just brought up questions in my mind. Um, and so I called Miss Elise just to ask her. I said, you know, who would have made that decision that she was buried next to him? Um, was that maybe somebody's wishes? And, you know, so I was trying to get a little bit of info behind that. And uh, Miss Elise told me over on the phone uh, back um, earlier in the... Uh, almost a year ago now when me and her first communicated over the phone and she said that in her opinion uh, she was confident that had neither one of them died they would have been married um, if you're watching these videos I'm sure you're familiar you probably even know more about uh, David and Drusha than I do uh, but the story goes David ended up in the home of the Edwards family was sick possibly tuberculosis Jerusha was the one who took care of him, and um, one thing me and Miss Elise talked about was, you know, the language that they used in speaking to one another. You know, we hear language like that, and we automatically assume, you know, deep, intimate love. One thing Miss Elise pointed out to me is, um, you know, that's how Christians should talk to each other, and were our motives and actions and affections, were all of that pure, um, you know, there would be pro there would be no problem with me and another man or me and another uh, female or whatever to be able to pour our hearts out to one another and actually talk about deep mutual love for one another, but yet nothing be bad or sinful about that. Um, so, if the, the language and the deep heartfelt love that David and Jerusha had between one another was purely the love that a brother and a sister in Christ can have for one another, that may be the case. Or, more than likely, had they not passed away, they would have been married. We don't know. Um, in, the, in the Lord's wisdom, Mr. David got sick and died when he did, and um, possibly so that Mr. Jonathan could have possession of his journal, uh, of David's uh, diary and journal, and uh, you, you're probably familiar with the history on that. How many people, how many missionaries have, have claimed that the diary and the journal of Brainerd had a, a deep, lasting impact on them? All right, so uh, that's at the cemetery there. Um, the next uh, that we have right here is um, um, Solomon Stoddard, and I believe it says in the book here, um, I can't remember who the other... Here we go. No, that's not it. Uh, let's see if I can find it quick, 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 quick. Okay, it's not coming to me. But here, here right here is um, Solomon. 
and I can't remember who the others were. Now, also in the Bridge Street Cemetery, there's um, a lot of uh, some more standing uh, memorials. Um, neither Jonathan nor Sarah are buried there, um, but it does have uh, their names and dates mentioned. Um, and so there's a, a lot of a lot of history there. The the children, Lucy, Timothy, Susanna, Eunice. Um, uh, Timothy Dwight's uh, wife, Mary Edwards, um, children that would go in that line. Okay, this what this was actually uh, Miss Mary right there. Okay, so now we go over to King Street and right here, Edwards Square. Which there's a church that sits there now. Can't remember exactly what type of church it was, um, but there, uh, supposedly, where King Street and what's now called Edward Square meets, is where the home of Jonathan uh, would have stood. All right, so uh, Miss Elise showed me that. Saint Valentine's Church is there now. All right. Next, we went over and saw the manse, which is would which would have been the home that Solomon Stoddard lived in. It's kind of up on a, a hill, and I would imagine, you know, you, you hear it in the, uh, let's see. I'm thinking it's in this book. Nope, it's not there. If you there, there's a picture that's pretty, pretty common. I've seen it in a couple different things. Um, the town of Northampton, what it would have looked like in Edward's day. Oh well, thought I thought I had it in there. Um, in Edward's day. In Solomon and Edward's time, um, what this home would have looked like, what the town of Northampton possibly would have looked like. And you have here uh, where Solomon lived, and it's kind of up on a hill, not really a mountain, but it is elevated enough that I would imagine before things were built up and trees were maybe tall and uh, brush, uh, you would have been able to look out, excuse me, over much of the town. Uh, so this is now a private home. Uh, someone lives there. I, if I remember right, I think Miss Elise told me that a doctor, uh, a doc or maybe a lawyer, a doctor or a lawyer lives there now. Um, we walked up in the driveway a little bit, and Miss Elise said that what we would call now the back of the house, you can see where the roof uh, comes over to your right, and then the you can see where it was added onto and goes up that from that point over was added after after Solomon. Uh, so this, this back portion of the house where the, the back chimney is, that would have been the home that Jonathan's grandfather on his mother's side, Solomon Stoddard, lived. And there's a, uh, a little um, um, thing about it. Okay, uh, back at the Forbes Library in the historical room, Miss um, Elise said that these works of Jonathan Edwards, the, the recent ones from Yale, that those were purchased for her in the library by a pastor from Florida. Uh, she said that the pastor in Florida, large-sized church, brought about 40 people uh, recently, maybe in the last few summers, and, uh, and showed the, the people there around town and that that was a gift um, from that church to the, the Forbes Library. Um, also, uh, pretty much all these other books that you see here are really, really, really old editions of the, the works of Edwards, different things that he wrote. All right, so that finishes up, um, that finishes up Monday, or excuse me, that finishes up uh, Wednesday, November the 1st. So um, there you have it. There you have um, Northampton. 
where Jonathan Edwards was an associate pastor, an assistant for a couple of years. And then the next two decades, it's where he spent as a pastor. All right, so I've tried on these videos to give you a, uh, to show you the pictures, to try to give a little bit of information behind each one of the pictures uh, without going on and on and on. And then I've also tried to close in like a, a little spiritual challenge or a tidbit or some kind of some kind of devotion of some sort. So uh, one thing that, that I can share with you here, you know, the Lord knew, the, the Lord knows everything we're going to face. I, I was speaking out on a visit earlier today with a, a guy who's going through a, a, a hard family situation. And I told him, I said, uh, I said you know, uh, this did not surprise God. God was not surprised or shocked when such and such in your life happened. Uh, we believe that the Lord uh, knows all things. And if he knows it, and if he could stop it, and he did it, then we trust that there is a, a reason for it. Now, that does not justify or excuse the bad or evil things that happen, but if God's ultimately in control, then we believe that God doesn't call everything good that is evil, but from evil he can, he can bring good. Well, you know, that, that's true in all of our lives, and that would be true in the life of, of Jonathan and Sarah as well. You know, you think of what they what they went through here at Northampton. Um, you know, being young, uh, you know, in, in spite of Edward's um, intellect, and his spiritual life, he's still a young man, or at least what we would consider a young man. He, he's still under 30 years old, and because Grandpa dies two years after he gets there, he all of a sudden becomes a pastor of, of a very large, influential church. Well, then he has a lot of children, and children require time. They require money. They require attention. Um, I would imagine church life in some ways was different back then than it is today, but I would also imagine that it's the same, no matter where you go in location or where you go in time. And so we, we think of, of what Jonathan went through as far as there's a pastor. He had a faithful wife who loved the Lord and loved him. He had children. Uh, Miss, uh, Miss Elise uh, talked about, um, uh, what's the little boy's name? Uh, Piney, little Piney, the, the last Edwards child. Uh, that she, said, uh, she said, well, I'm not so sure about him. Um, but, but for the most part, the, the children all seem to, to be Christians who love the Lord. Um, but, but, he, but he still had his, his challenges. You know, you've got a church where I, I try to imagine, I think about this sometimes, where he spent most of his life, a good portion of his life, and he gave them his life. He, he prepared, he preached for them. Um, you, you look at the... Uh, you, you look at the, the sermons that Jonathan wrote, um, the, the volumes from the works of Edwards, and, and, and that's just a, a, a sample. I'm sure it's not all, all of the things that he wrote. Um, you've got uh, volume, volume 14, volume 17, volume 19, volume 22. Uh, volume, volume 25. You, you have all those volumes from the works of Edwards where Edwards, the theologian, Edwards the philosopher, was also Edwards the pastor who preached God's word. And, and, and you, you read through, those, through some of those sermons, and, and I've only scratched the surface of what I have, and, and you, you realize, hey, he, he composed and preached these sermons not in a church with five people and all five were spiritually mature that never needed his attention, but, but he composed these sermons um, in a large church that how he allowed it, I'm sure, would have demanded every minute that he could have given them. But you know, when he was dismissed from Northampton, he had a... a I'm going to call a friend. I don't know if he ever used that word friend with John Erskine, but he had a correspondent over, I believe it was in Scotland, Mr. John Erskine. 
And he wrote to, to John Erskine after he was dismissed, uh, which was in June 22, 1750. There's a letter uh, that, uh, John, that Jonathan wrote John in July of 1750. And he, he, he tells Mr. Erskine about uh, the recent things that have happened, how he was voted out of Northampton, uh, supposedly a, a ratio of about 10 to 1, 230 against him, and 23 for him remaining as pastor. Well, he, he wrote to Mr. Erskine, and he said, um, I'm, I'm, we're, we're cast onto the wide open ocean of this world. But he, but he said that he wasn't afraid, and then his family wasn't afraid. And then he talked about what he was going to do next that he didn't know. He said, there, there's a line in there that I still remember, a couple of lines. One was uh, our confused system of church government and how that he would have no problem with, uh, with Mr. Erskine's method of church government. But then he also said in there that he, as far as going back into secular work, that he, he wasn't cut out for that. Now, that's not to say that he was not a hard worker, and, and this is something that comes up in today's day and time. You know, if, if you give people the impression that you don't want to do, now, I know this thing, all work spiritual, or, you know, work no work is secular. I understand that. But, but the idea of a minister not working a real job, as people like to put it, sarcastically, um, you know, the idea of a preacher not working a real job spending his life in devotion and Bible reading and prayer and studying and reading and writing so that when he preached it is as if you know the, the I, I was going to say an angel is preaching but something better than an angel an angel isn't redeemed we are I mean ju just sermons that if you know here we are today in 2018 I was reading a sermon recently of Edwards about uh, Christ's agony and, and just brought to tears, brought to tears from Luke uh, chapter 22, I believe, verse 44, about Jesus um, praying and his sweat become, as it were, great drops of blood. And then Edwards said that every drop of blood, in every drop of blood that Christ shed, it was a manifestation of an ocean of love that come from God's heart. Well, you don't come up with phrases and, and, and sentences and paragraphs like that if you're spending 15 hours a day trying to make church folks happy because they're upset. You, you just don't do that. Well, how do you write sermons that if they, if they hit me like a ton of bricks and I'm just reading them, I can't imagine what it would have been like to have heard them you know, in person? Well, that requires time to study. And I'm going to add more than that. That requires time not just in studying, but thinking about what you're studying, you know, pondering over it, let, letting it go through your mind, minutes and even hours. Um, I, I don't, you know, the neck of the woods that you're in, I don't know what things are like. The neck of the woods I'm in, I'm not sure if things are the same everywhere or not. But there's a mindset, and I know we can get to, to various extremes from, from one extreme to the other, but I would say somewhere there is the, the, the happy median. And some people say Edwards did not figure out that happy median. They would say he was too far to the other side. But the desk that Edwards sat at and studied in the words of his biographer 12, 13 hours a day, it was not in vain. Now, some people have said, I, I, I remember listening to a lecture one day where the guy kind of hypothesized if Edwards had spent about two hours, a few hours a week, maybe an hour on Tuesday afternoon and an hour on Thursday afternoon, just going out and seeing people in town, that would have get, given him enough pull and influence with the people. They would have related to him enough so that when the controversy concerning communion did come in, um, towards the end there of his pastorate, they would have been more inclined, maybe more sympathetic to Edwards as a person, and he would have been able to stay. And if he stayed, he may not have ended up at Stockbridge, and then there he may not have wrote his masterpieces, and maybe he never would have ended up at, at Princeton and, and passed away you know, far too young in, in, human, in our human wisdom. We don't know how all that have worked out. But Edwards said 
uh, in that going back, I, I warned you, I, I ramble too much, but going back to that letter that um, Jonathan wrote to Mr. Erskine, he said that he was a man given to study. I, I remember that exact phrase. He, he spoke in there about the, the secular work, the secular employment. He, he There's no way he would do anything meaningful with that because that's just not what he was. Um, he, he spent his time with God. And he said he was a man given to study. If we could go back then, you know, let's say he was dismissed in uh, 1750. Let's say we could go back to 1760, 1770, 1759, somewhere in there. You know, if we could go back to March 23rd, 1758, the day after he died, and just stand in front of that church and say, you had a pastor. He may not have visited as much as pastors were expected to visit. I don't know what it was like back then, although I do know what it's like in the Bible Belt now. Perhaps there was an ex expectation if people back then are as the same they are today, where the pastor didn't really need to study, didn't really need to pray. He just needed to spend time and get to know the people, you know, coffee and lunch and breakfast and dinner with the with the congregation every single day from sun up to sundown so that he can just really know the flock if we could stand before that congregation and say you had a man who studied God's word supposedly 12 to 13 hours a day supposedly 6 days a week who never who, who was faithful to his wife who had children who loved the Lord, who have who had a lineage that was, you know, far better than any lineage I've ever been a part of, as far as, you know, were influence and government and college presidents and things like that. And you kicked them out. And it wasn't fifty fifty, it wasn't fifty one forty nine, it wasn't sixty forty, it was ninety percent opposed, ten percent in favor. And if we could look at the church at Northampton and say, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? You had a man who, in, in two areas of controversy, he stood up. You know, there's a lot of talk today about abuse and sexual abuse, sexual abuse, and, um, and, and men and women and, you know, all kind of stuff been in the news the last few months. You had a man during the bad book controversy case who stood up for what was right concerning how men should treat women and how young men should talk and not talk to young women. And then, but, but we know the situation there, you know, these parents got upset because their kids got painted in a bad light. And, and people, you know, talk about how Edwards could have handled that um, in a better way. Um, I would say we all make mistakes, and especially when it comes to, to matters like that. Uh, you get parents of teenagers upset, and it usually doesn't work out good. But but Edward stood up for, for how men and women should relate with one another in purity. And then, when it come to the to the, the halfway covenant, the communion controversy, I'm, I'm trying to look at that as a Baptist, so I'm sure I don't understand all that exactly. But you've had what Edwards went through on that. He wrote a book explaining what he believed. To, to my knowledge, I, I believe that the, the response was, uh, uh, don't preach about it, write a book. He writes a book, and then they say, we don't want to read your book. It, it was a, a no-win situation that he was in. But he would not change what he believed unless, let, let's borrow from the words of Luther now, unless he was convinced by Scripture. And Edwards, after the passing of time, I, although I have not read these documents yet, so I don't know exactly how all this went down as far as the uh, the uh, the controversy there and the, the communion and the Lord's Supper and such. But looking back over Edwards' life, I remember reading some places where Edwards had began to, to realize, hey, what Grandpa taught wasn't biblical. And while Grandpa may have had good intentions good intentions don't trump the Bible. The Bible trumps good intentions. And Edwards stood firm, and he was willing to be dismissed by his church, handle it in a very mature, spiritual manner, instead of, so to speak, 
uh, taking his keys off of his belt, setting them on the pulpit, and walking out and saying, Good riddance. He didn't do that. He handled it with, with faithfulness to the Lord and humility among those people. And because of that, one reason because of many, uh, we're still reading about him today. So that, that was a long spiritual uh, tidbit there, a little challenge for us. That number one, the Lord knows what kind of church situation we're in. And none of us are in a perfect church situation because we're all part of churches that are made up of sinners, including ourselves. And sometimes in those situations, we find ourselves in a mess. We find ourselves in a crucible. We find ourselves going through the fire. And we may wonder, Lord, what's going on? What are you doing? Well, what was the Lord doing? At, at New York City, the Lord was preparing Jonathan for Bolton. However long Bolton lasts. At Bolton, what was the Lord doing? The Lord was preparing Jonathan at Bolton for Northampton as an assistant. What was the Lord doing there? As an assistant at Northampton up under Solomon Stoddard, the Lord was preparing him to become the pastor. What was the Lord doing then? He was preparing him at Northampton as the pastor to be a missionary to the Indians at Stockbridge. Well, what was the Lord doing there? He was preparing him to be the president for a very short time at the College of New Jersey, or what we would call Princeton. And looking back over the course of his life from October 5th, 1703 to March 22nd, 1758, what was the Lord doing in the life of Jonathan Edwards? He was preparing him for eternity. And that's what the Lord is doing for all of us, brothers and sisters in Christ. Right now, the Lord is preparing us for tomorrow and for the eternal world. And so let's make sure that we don't waste the time, the opportunities that we have right now. While we're in the fire right now, remember and realize that what the Lord is doing is He's purifying us and He's refining us so that we can be of greater use throughout the rest of our lives and looking at the whole of our Christian life so that we can be used according to whatever our work shall be in heaven. All right, so that'll, that'll finish up uh, video number four, which covers day number three of the Jonathan Edwards trip, which was on November 1st, 2017. The next video will take us to Thursday, November 2nd, 2017, where much of the day was spent in traveling, but we went back to East Windsor to see if the birth marker for Jonathan Edwards would put back up yet, and it wasn't, and then we went on over to see where David Brainerd was born in um, either Haddam or Haddam, uh, Connecticut, forgive me for the mispronunciation, and then we spent some more time traveling down to Princeton to see the room, the, the house and the actual room where Edwards died, and then the resting spot where Jonathan and Sarah are buried. So I uh, appreciate you watching the videos. I know they get a little lengthy, uh, but it was uh, the, the trip of a lifetime that I was able to take. Uh, so forgive me for rambling on too much and hope that you'll uh, subscribe to the channel, save the playlist, like the videos, comment, and, uh, and share them maybe with other Edwards fans that you may know of. And um, uh, right now it's Friday afternoon, I'm gonna head home shortly. Hopefully this, this coming weekend, maybe, maybe between Saturday and then Sunday afternoon between church services, I can finish up the videos for Thursday and Friday, and then maybe after I think about it over the weekend, kind of a concluding uh, video, um, some takeaways from a general perspective on how, how the trip went and the life of Edwards as a whole. All right, thanks for watching, and we will record a new video for you shortly. Until then, we'll see you later.